Hello everybody, welcome to the ARE Startup Podcast, a series dedicated to enterprise entrepreneurship and startups. We will be joined by a wide range of guest speakers who will be sharing about their journey, their personal story, some valuable insights into how to start a business. So stay tuned with us to get some amazing tips and advices from these amazing guest speakers. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Let's welcome our guest for today. Welcome to the ARU Startup Podcast. My name is Omkar Singh and today we are joined by Mike Hurd. Hello, Mike. We are delighted to have you on our show. It's a pleasure to join you, Omkar. Thank you so much for joining us. And would you like to begin with introducing yourself and, and the background you have in enterprise and entrepreneurship in general? Of course, yeah. Uh, well, I started uh, my sort of career having done a degree which is very interesting, it was in applied physics and business studies. The problem was, was that no one recognised it because it wasn't, at the time, wasn't from one of the top universities and wasn't a, just a straight physics degree and that type of thing. And uh, and I actually had a, a summer job where I worked on a diving ship and I worked out in the North Sea and uh, all sorts of things happened and ended up with two people getting killed. And strange enough, that made me say, I really want to work offshore in the, the North Sea, that type of work. And so I gave up the job that I'd been offered in a bank to go and join an oil company. This in the days when oil companies weren't big baddies. And, um, and at the time, because they didn't recognise my degree, I had to teach myself and work my way up within the, the organisation. And part of that was by being entrepreneurial. I didn't go through the, the standard sort of uh, graduate recruitment. I learned, I interacted with people, I found new ways of doing things, I built skills and made myself extraordinarily useful and, uh, and allowed people within that organization to help me learn the job and become uh, what was called a reservoir engineer within that site. And I then spent the next 15 years working around the world doing that. And uh, Having done that, uh, I decided that I really would quite like to do something else. And uh, I started a job down in Brighton, uh, running or starting off one of the, the first technology incubators in the UK after the Cambridge St. John's. This was the, the and Oxford Innovation. This was the third one to be open in the UK. And really, it was to work with people that had ideas. And sometimes there were students, graduates, other writers, people in the community to help make Brighton a tech area as opposed to just a sort of seaside place where people went for, for boozy nights out. And, uh, and for 20 years, I built and ran a very successful tech incubator, helping people launch new products, raise investment, but most importantly, build companies and help realize their ambition. Uh, so after 20 Three years I stopped doing that and uh, sort of just retired from that and uh, moved up to Cambridge for, for family reasons and uh, got introduced to, to Anglia Ruskin uh, and they felt that they could usefully use my experience in terms of student entrepreneurship, helping businesses, helping graduates. And so I've come on board with Anglia Ruskin as a visiting professor and supporting the whole student entrepreneurship uh, programs uh, and working uh, on that side. So hopefully that that introduces that. Yeah, definitely. I think, thank you so much for introducing yourself. And then you have a huge experience in dealing with the businesses and helping the other businesses to flourish. And especially the part where you have helped the others to raise millions of investment and the grant capitals. We are delighted to have your association with the university. and. Yeah, I'm looking forward to how it goes further. Just linking this one same with the uh, topic we have it for today is about how to raise investments for for the startups, for the early stage uh, businesses. Here at the university, we have students and, and, and the graduates who are exploring about different ideas or businesses, but really looking for funding, the initial capital to start their business. And then, and this always questions comes in is about how to find an investor. And where should they explore to get the investors up? These things, this is the first questions comes in. So what are your thoughts around this one? Well, I think, first of all, people can sometimes get the wrong idea about investment in the fact that they think that all businesses start with investment. And in fact, 
very, very few businesses start with external investment. They often have the investment of the founders, sometimes the founders, founders' friends and family, but getting an external investor is actually really quite rare. It's in the sort of few percent of companies actually start up successfully uh, that way. And so it's important to realize that often the stories that you hear and the, the, you know, the stories you hear, the sort of big American tech giants, that type of thing, it's all investment, investment, the biotech companies, that sort of thing, it's investment. Um, but those are the exceptions. And so that um, what you have to realize in terms of gaining investment is that the investors are looking for a certain type of company and you have to position yourself as that type of company to get their interest. And so what can happen is people think they want, need to get investment. And so they focus purely on investment as opposed to looking at what grants might be available or how else they could start their business in terms of getting a, a, an income alongside or getting a revenue going, getting the first business going and then which to then build potential uh, a business from that which might need investment later on. Sometimes debt uh, is involved in, on that side, but having an appreciation of, of all different types of funding is important rather than just saying, right, I want to start a business, I need an investor. Because most investors won't be looking for a new startup that hasn't proved their product, their idea or their experience. Um, so that, that's a key thing is to actually look at all your options to start off with, because starting from the beginning, thinking you need an investor can be very frustrating because it can take a long time. You may well be unsuccessful and that all the time that you are pitching your ideas and going around trying to find investors to pitch to, you're not actually building and developing your business or if you are you're neglecting it because you're spending all your time trying to get investment. So it, it that's one of the areas where it's, it makes a lot of sense to, to find uh, someone that you trust and someone that, you, that has the right experience to talk you through your business and your options to see whether investment is the right uh, way to go for you. Now that, that's very helpful. Uh, even to explore the options around about investments and not all the businesses required to go for it. But we always keep on hearing about venture capitals, uh, seed funding investors, uh, the government investments, banks, universities. How they are different to each other and are, there, are they open for students to opt for? Uh, well, I think again, the, the point is to not all investors are the same. So that recognizing that there are different types of investors who are looking for different things uh, and understanding that is actually critical to how you would pitch and how you would present yourself to an investor. So sometimes you'll get what are called angel investors. So this is individual people that have, uh, have got a bit of money. They've had a successful business or for whatever other reason they've, they've got some cash. They wish to invest in other companies. And they have very different aspirations for their investment than a venture capital company or a fund manager who is running from that side. And the reason why I say it's different is that an individual investor may be looking for different things. They might be looking to invest because they want to get involved in an exciting new venture. They may not actually need the money, if you know what I mean, that it's it's almost like a risk investment is like going and uh, betting on the horses or that type of thing. They know what they can afford to lose, and that's money that they feel that they can put in and work with a company, partly because it's it's interesting and it's fascinating and keeps them involved in an exciting uh, option. The other thing that's very important with uh, angel investors is that quite often they'll be doing it to support their own passion and their own interests. So that you may find investors that saying, actually, I really like what you're doing and I like your enthusiasm and I want to support you. And uh, and if I make a bit of money out of it, that's great uh, at the end. And so they and you can get impact investors and philanthropic investors that might want to support a more of a social venture because of what you can develop for society through running the business. 
And what they want to do is to use their business experience to help you achieve that goal. So that's one type of investor and understanding their motivations is, is really important. Where you have a fund manager, and that is someone who is managing somebody else's money. And that might be what's called a family office, which might be a family which has a lot of uh, investment funds that they want to invest on. And then he invests or he or she invests on their behalf, or it might be a venture capital fund, or it might be a corporate fund on that side. And so those fund managers, they are looking to build a portfolio of investment interests where the between that portfolio or across that portfolio, they want to make a certain return. Now, because of the risk profile of investments, they might be expecting that seven or eight out of 10 of those investments will go bust. So all the return that they want needs to come from one or two of the investments they make, which is why people often talk about having a tenfold return on the investment money. An individual investor, may not be looking for that. They just want to say, I don't want to lose my money, but I'm not sure what, how much I need to make because they're often not investing it for the, the, the income return from it. But a fund manager, one of the key things they're doing is they're trying to minimize the risk of their investment. They don't want to look foolish. They don't want to invest in a dud. So they will be far more, often far more risk averse than an individual investor because an individual investor can think, I can use my experience to help this company succeed so I can help fill those gaps. So you've got individual investors, you've got uh, fund managers, you've got corporate investors. So that might be a larger company who is wanting to uh, invest in a new idea or a smaller company. Now, a key thing for them might be that it might be a strategic investment for them because they want your ideas and your technology to help them build a better business. So sometimes they might be looking at how much profit they can make out of your idea rather than how much money you can make out of your idea, if you see the difference uh, on that side. So again, it's looking at their motivations. And then sometimes you get, as you say, uh, public funds, uh, uh, the British Business Bank, uh, people like that, government funds, they're wanting to promote the economic um, growth within the region they may be saying all this investment is to generate jobs if you don't in, if not if you don't create jobs i don't want to invest there they again they don't want a company that's going to go bust very quickly so they will want to uh, minimize their risk because they might be judged as wasting public money so they will be uh, more risk averse but they have very particular things they don't particularly just want a company that's going to grow very quickly and then be sold and move abroad, they're looking to build economic development. So there are a whole profile uh, spectrum of different types of investors. The key thing is understanding what the investor's motivation is. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'm specifically speaking about uh, ARU and just taking one, one example. If a student is having an innovative product related to technology, and they want to market here in the UK after commercial business running. Is there any sort of grants available uh, specifically for the students from the government side? So at the moment, they uh, it's not focused particularly on ARU students. There's no funds specifically for that. Uh, there are lots of startup loan funds uh, around and there is investment uh, funds available from within uh, within the what are called the the lep areas so the if you look through something called growth works in each uh, area whether you're in chelmsford or uh, in cambridge that type of thing there there are often equity funds within there where students can uh, apply for and be put forward to investors it's a very competitive uh, arena, so you'll be looked at across a whole range of other companies looking at uh, investment. Um, and what you you have is that there are funds, for example, in Cambridge, which are more linked to uh, technology companies coming out of Cambridge University, 
that associated with that, there are funds which are also looking for broader projects uh, and particularly within certain sectors. So if, with, if it's within the sustainability or the a green type of uh, business, then it, there's funds associated with that, some for healthcare and biotech and various other sort of sectors as well, agritech as well. And so within those, the key thing there is understanding which organizations uh, have access to which type of funds and the way they work. Uh, a good example is uh, Carbon 13 for uh, projects which are linked to uh, the environment. Uh, one of the companies I've been working with, they've got accepted by Carbon 13, received £100,000 investment from them, and that was built up to, I think, £300,000 investment from their partners as well. And also, the Carbon 13 helped that uh, that entrepreneur to be linked to another entrepreneur to create their first team and drive it forward on that site. So those sorts of funds are there. Um, they're not specific to Anglo Ruskin, but they are used to working with uh, uh, graduates coming out of university with with good ideas. Yeah, I mean, when we say about uh, students at Anglo Ruskin, I, I am more tending towards the students who want to start the business out of the university. I'm sure at the university we have uh, the pitching competition running annually and now we are looking to make it trimester wise, which is which is going on. But I think externally when student wants to approach the investors, that's the point where it comes in for the public funds, yeah. the banking and those areas. Uh, yeah, th thank you so much for explaining. I think there's a, a a lot of wide range of investors. So the the first point for the students or the graduates who are looking for raising investment is identify your investor and then look at the funds available. That's that's the first step you suggest. All right, then my next question is, how do a startup or a pre-startup stage determine that's the right time for them to go for investment? So a, a key thing with getting investment is that, uh, in, in some ways, people will say it's the most expensive type of money you can get. Uh, because even though you're not having to pay interest or you don't necessarily have to pay it back, you're giving a share of your company and you're giving a share of your idea away. And if that company does, uh, that idea does realise its potential and come to fruition, then it can be an expensive uh, parting that you've, you've given away in terms of that, that investment share. So finding the time within the business which where you had the the best valuation in terms of that investment uh, is, again, a, an important aspect. When you're at the very start of your entrepreneurial journey, and if you haven't, say, actually made your first product or got your product ready for sale, you haven't got any customers, but you haven't built a team, that type of thing, uh, then obviously the valuation is going to be very low. And at that stage, then somebody coming in, they if they were to try and do a valuation as an accountant would and say, well, actually, what assets have you got and what revenue you've got? All those are, are zero. Then if they were putting any amount of money in, would almost own the whole company. So you have to try and say, well, no, how do we reach a balanced discussion about um how can I still have motivation as an entrepreneur to build the business, but enough interest for the investor to take that forward? Um, so that as you start to grow the business, then hopefully what you're doing is you are increasing the profile and the chances of the business becoming a success because you are proving that you can produce the product or you can produce the your minimum viable product in that case. You will be getting your first um, customer responses and getting that reaction from the market and understanding it from, from that side. And so all those things that you do, building your team, they all start to increase the perceived valuation of your business uh, because it, it shows how much more confidence an investor might have that you can actually achieve the growth and build the business that you, you're presenting to them. And then as that grows uh, as well, so then it becomes a question as to, okay, well, at this stage, 
I need this much money, but this is the valuation I have for the company. So I might have to give away 30, 40% of the company. Whereas if I can grow the company a little bit more from what other ed, whatever other means I can through revenue, grants, loans, whatever, then I will increase the valuation of the company and then I'll be giving less of that away. So it's always a balancing act uh, on that side. The worst, it's it's awful thing with, with money in, in, in many ways, that the worst time to go for investment is when you really, really need the money. Because that's when you look at your riskiest and you look desperate. So that when you're really enthusiastic, you're, you're fired up, you're, you're really driving something forward, that is when an investor will like you best. Uh, and that's when you'll get the, the better valuation uh, on that side. And that's why it's, it's often... Uh, you know, the, the benefits of people, what they call bootstrapping the business uh, forward uh, in the early years and trying to bring together whatever resources you can to actually prove the potential of the business to be able to get uh, a better valuation uh, on that side. Mm, thank you so much. And and do you think uh, you just just slightly picked up about the research and finding your first customer? Do you think it is important for startups to have the market research and MV, MVPs done before they reach to investors, or is something an ongoing process? Well, it, it's the more you can uh, prove your idea, the better. Now, the point within uh, an MVP is to what you can show with it so it would be nice if an mvp was you know a very just uh, simple version of the product which did everything that your product would do and you can sell it in the marketplace but in many cases you can't do that because you can't afford that that develop so one example i could give was a, a company i still do a lot of work with at the moment who developed a, a very successful product for, for tracking students within schools and tracking their progress their MVP was a very complicated Excel spreadsheet. But with that, they could get the feedback from other teachers, feedback from schools as to how good the product was. And that allowed them to actually get the investment to have it built as a proper software product, which could then be sold. So it was you you're using and you might have a number of different MVPs to prove different elements of a product. So it could be that if it's a physical product, it could be, say, something which says, this shows the function of the product, but it doesn't look anything like it. But this over here, this shows what the product would look like, and this is the customer feedback I'm getting on that. So you can use different types of uh, MVP or prototype to show the customer reaction and to give confidence that someone will actually spend money to actually buy that product. Uh, and actually getting that, that customer feedback is really, really important. There are some times when you can't do it, and uh, you know that's where people going on you know very long, you know research and development projects and that type of thing where you can't say here's my prototype drug. You know I've tried it on a bunch of people and they didn't die. Let's move forward. Um, so you can't do that. There is a particular way in which you raise money for those sorts of uh, high capital investment projects, but for many ideas, you're trying to get that feedback. I'm just trying to understand how uh, this plays an important role before maybe pitch to the investors. And well, as we just have, to, just to add yeah. a couple of things on that is that the amount of times in my uh, career, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds, thousands of ideas and that type of thing, the amount of times that I've sat with someone where they're telling me about their unique idea, and I happen to just do about two minutes searching on Google while I'm talking to them, <laughs> say, you mean like this one? <laughs> where people just haven't done the basic research. Uh -huh. And what you need to do in, in some instances, it's just testing that is there a product on the market that, that's similar to what you're trying to do, that you are, are you going to be competing with that? Because it's that balance between if there is a competing product, it shows there probably is a market out there, but obviously you then have to show why you're better that, at it than, than that yeah. product. Uh, in some cases, it might be about intellectual property and patents and uh, that type of thing. In some instances, it might be something where you're saying, OK, this is a product which is works in one market. What I want to do is to 
apply it to a different market. And that's why I can show that it does work. It's just I need to show it with a different market on that side. So it's a question of doing what you can to show that there is a market that people will want your product and that there is some understanding of the, the pricing and, and the size of that market. And, and as you mentioned about helping other businesses raise millions of investments, can you recall, can you recall any any specific incident of uh, investment where it was surprisingly you, that came across that whether it was a positive surprise or a negative one? <laughs> um, so in terms of surprise, I think here's one sort of interesting example. Uh, was a company that had uh, well the background is I've I've seen all sorts of people coming up with new types of camera technology to be used in selling houses so whether it was uh, fisheye lenses whether it's video walkthroughs whether it's sort of uh, 3d imaging that type of thing I must have seen 30 or 40 different companies coming to me with different versions of that type of product all of which didn't quite actually succeed that much. Sometimes they found other markets uh, and that type of thing. But there's this one company that had developed a very good product uh, on that side, and it was sort of like a, a video walkthrough, and it, it had a commentary uh, that went with it, uh, and they were getting quite a lot of success. And so they'd raised some initial investment, uh, and they managed to get to a reasonable revenue with their business. And it's all about they would provide, provide, it's called an audio agent to start off with, and they would provide a soundtrack for doing a walkthrough around a house and that type of thing. So you didn't have to have an estate agent with you or for a flat being rented, that type of thing. And they were doing finally, and they got the investment, that type of thing. And then the company just sort of stalled. It wasn't really going anywhere. And uh, and really, the, the conversation that, that we had with them on, on that side was that the housing market was getting quite com very competitive. It was the estate agents weren't making a lot of money. And so the company was having problems selling their product to estate agents to use in their how they sold houses because it was an additional cost for the estate agent and they were put off by that. And so we thought about it and turned it around because the, their investors were getting a little bit uh, anxious and they, they needed to raise more money and they couldn't get more investment. And we looked at it and said, well, what if it wasn't a cost to the said agents? What if it was extra revenue? What if you didn't sell it as part of the service, but you actually sold it to the homeowner as an extra that they could have on their house? Um, what we did and what we helped them do on, on the research and that type of thing was to show that if a uh, if someone selling the house that had a this product, then they would sell their house quicker and they would probably sell it for slightly more money. And to have that, wouldn't they be prepared to spend an extra two, three hundred pounds to have that product on top of what they were paying the said agent uh, in fees? And the product was enhanced, there were all sorts of clever things that came with it. But what happened was that then it was a product the estate agents could sell. It was an extra revenue source. And with that, they were suddenly able to bring in additional investment because they could show that the customers who were the home owners or home sellers wanted it rather than the estate agents who didn't really want it. And so this company managed to raise an extra, in that case, it was an extra million pounds worth of investment and went from a sort of half a million turnover to five million turnover in about two years. But it's that slight change of the business model, which yeah. then provided that surprise in how quickly the product could take off uh, in the market. Yeah, that's a very interesting example. And and in terms of, uh, you, have, you have very closely seen the business as going in front of investors. And I'm, I'm sure pitching to the investors. Uh, do, do, can you just highlight a couple of uh, do's and don'ts for them, uh, for those who are go going and meeting the investors in the first place? 
one of the things to do if you can do is to get an investor to give you their reaction before you go and pitch so to find someone that does do investments they might not want to invest in your business but they can give you that inside thought as to how an investor thinks and what they're looking for uh, in a business so that is a key thing and that can be very uh really she'll give you some really good insights on that side uh some other do's is be yourself so that what can happen is that uh you might say well i'll get an accountant to write my business plan and i'll get a marketing company to write my marketing plan and do my pitch and i'll get someone else to do that and i don't really understand the technology anyway because i've got someone else to do that and suddenly it's not your pitch anymore and quite often for an early stage company what the investor is looking for is the people that can drive it forward so the key thing they all look for is how good is the entrepreneur and how confident am i in them that they can actually achieve this goal and have they or can they build a, a team around them to actually drive this this project home a, a, a third do which is uh, it sounds very uh, dry and technical is especially if you're talking to angel investors is understand the tax benefits for investors for companies at different stages because what you need to do is make sure that you are tax efficient for those investors because they will expect you to be and if you don't understand it they will think that you don't you're not really serious uh, on that side a couple of don'ts don't oversell the business because one thing is people will think you're uh, that they'll think you're naive they'll think you'll be you, you say oh, i'm going to be a, i'm going to be as big as facebook in three years time it's that type of thing and it just sort of sounds like you don't really know what you're talking about so being realistic but still achieving those uh those goals and recognizing that uh even when you have things like um SaaS type businesses where you don't have a huge cost of sale but it'll grow you'll still have large costs of growing a business so what often happens people show the revenue rising like that but costs stay like that but it never happens so again it's being realistic and understanding it uh, from that point of view uh, another don't would be don't make up legals don't think oh well, that sounds a bit legalese i'll write it in there or I'll take this bit of a uh, legal chunk of text and put it in in my sort of uh, legal terms or that type of thing because if you don't understand it you quite often will be agreeing to something that you didn't intend to so you do need to take advice and make sure that you agree with an investor what you want and then get a, a lawyer to put that into paperwork don't start with somebody else's paperwork and just say I don't really understand it but I'll agree to it anyway. <laughs> um yeah. As I said the the key thing is understanding or even asking what an investor wants. Because especially uh, individual investors partly what they want is to share their experience and to help you to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And and while pitching to an investor uh do the investors think a team is important to have it while running a business or even a, a sole person can just raise will it make any difference I, it will certainly make a difference uh and sort of in terms of the general research teams always have a, a much better chance of uh, achieving the success than individuals do what that means is that the individual needs to recognize they need to build a team and so that is part of the investment process if an individual says he's going to do it all themselves and not need a team then that won't be uh seen as being very credible but recognizing what skills and what strengths you need to build a, a business then and even especially if you can identify people that you say are going to fill those roles and that's a, a key thing because that's what an investor is investing for it's in, to allow you to try and build uh, that team just one thing that uh, often comes up is that um 
some investors are very reluctant to pay the entrepreneurs a proper salary and think that that is what the, the entrepreneur is, uh, that's what they're giving to the project and that type of thing, which is sometimes can work, but sometimes we think, well, it doesn't really help if the, if the entrepreneur can't afford to live, can't afford a house, all, all those sort of things. And so being able to, again, justify and paint your position properly is, is important. It's not to go in there as a new student, you know, new graduate say, well, what I want is a salary of £150,000 a year. And what I want is investment of £150,000. Basically, you're going to pay my salary for a year. That, that's not going to work. But it's sort of recognising, you know, how can you invest your time in the in the business uh, and still live? Does it mean you have to have doing some other work on the side or what is a reasonable amount of money for you to, to, to live off uh, to take that forward? So think th those things through. And as I say, uh, as I started this, is look at the other types of funding you can potentially bring into the business. And, you know, the, the big picture uh, events are um, a really great idea as well, because that can give some of that initial sort of funding as, as a grant from the, the business from the university to help establish that company from the side but for example just on that was if what you need to do is you need a lot of computers then it might well be that that's something that you can rent or lease or that type of thing or borrow in order to get yourself started yeah i think some yeah, some some great advices for those it is very interesting you say that the in the, it, it is really uh, impacted when uh, individual pitch and then the team pitches together for the business ideas and how it is different to each other. Uh, because we come across students who have the idea, but they are very individual and they're looking for co-founders and they directly approach the investors, but they don't have the uh, expected results from the investment routes. So I think it's very uh, good takeaway and understanding very good insights from the investors perspective that they look for a good team to go ahead with the ideas. Well, it, it, it's got to be the, it, again. It's got to be the right type of team, in a sense. So I, I used to have a uh, often sort of uh, smiled when I used to get teams of postgraduates coming from the from the university I was working at at the time, and they would say, "Right, we are four uh, PhD physicists that want to start a business. We all want to be CTO because we're all technical." And you say, "Well, who's going to do the yeah. marketing? Who's going to do the finance? Who's going to do the sales? That type of thing." So it's having that balance of uh, of skills uh, and interests on that side, and it it is quite difficult, you know, to to get that fully balanced team at the beginning. Um, but that's where again the university can can help on that side, but also to look for people that can can help you build that that rounded team, uh, because again you need all those skills in order to make the business work. Some of it, yeah. You can outsource at the beginning and you can say, right, well, if I do get this investment, then this is the the marketing consultant or company I'm going to use to begin with until I can afford to hire my own marketing people. And, uh, you know, and they've given me a reduced rate to be involved in this, this project at the start. Rather than having a, a expensive finance director, I've uh, arranged here that someone is going to do it for one day a month. And just give me some advice on that, but I'm going to do basic bookkeeping. Or I'm going to do that myself. So it's understanding that you need the skills. How you build those skills into the business is part of being entrepreneurial. You know, it, all those different aspects you bring into it to find ways of helping the company to succeed. And on the same lines, do you think founders or co-founders' background is important? Do are they being judged about the backgrounds of education or the background of experiences they come from? Well, different people judge things on, on, on different ways. So that, uh, you know, again, you, you might find that um, the fund managers would say, what we want is serial engineers, uh, serial entrepreneurs, people who've done it before. And, you know, but not everyone. Someone, everybody has to do it for the first time sometime. Uh, and it's again, it's how you present uh, your experience. And what you take from that experience to show that it will give you a better chance in order to, to make that, this new venture uh, work. Um, so that, you know, there are ways of presenting uh, whatever background you've got 
in, in the same way as you will write a CV in, in a certain way. And if you just put it down in, in, in without thinking, this is just my experience, it, it can't be applied to the job. Being an entrepreneur is bringing those skills together to do a job, which is to take that, that idea forward. And the rest of the team need to do that as well. So that it might be different aspects of your, uh, your background and your personality, which will help you uh, to do it. And personality, especially for early stage companies, Personality is a big thing because that's part of the, the way in which you will sell yourself, sell the business, sell the product and sell the idea. Thank you. Thank you for that. And before before the uh, students or, or the in, uh, the startup founders, they pitch uh, to the investors. Are there any particular things they must be mindful of when they go for pitching? It is a balance of, of, of arrogance if you like, so that you want to be confident, but not so confident that you don't recognize that you need the help and will benefit from the input uh, of investors from that side. Um, so there can be another aspect that people can go into it on the basis that um, they almost expect that everyone's going to invest that you're stupid if you don't invest in me and that's that's wrong you know you have to make the, the case for the investment which is partly the idea and partly you as an individual in, in how you do it so i think it's being a quite um careful as to understanding as to how we, the individual and how you come across when you are pitching and how you engage the audience and make yourself someone that they want to work with uh, in the future and that you can look at it from their perspective and that is a, a key thing that there's something which um, I, i'm sure you onker have, have done with various projects which is doing something called that value proposition which is a very common uh, business tool of how to look at a product uh, and what i often do with people is do it as an investor proposition how do you completely focus on your company as to how an investor would view it and how do you position all your responses, position all the things about your product and your business to make it attractive to an investor. And that is very different from a customer because what so many people do is they go into a investment pitch and they pitch as if they were trying to sell the product to a customer. Now it's the wrong pitch and it doesn't give the right information. And it focuses too much on the on the product, whereas you're wanting to give a balanced pitch, which has as much about the product as it does about the, the market, as it does about the, the team, as it does about the, the way in which you will build and sell the product on that side and how you build the company. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. As we come to conclusion, I have one final question is uh, startups to face rejections from investors and on a regular basis to do. What uh, some advices you would like to give them how to overcome this, these rejections for them? I think to, if you can, it's getting feedback. Uh, it, it can be really useful when you, you see a video of yourself pitching and actually analyzing it from, from that point of view as to how you come across. If you can get uh, feedback from an honest feedback from people who are organizing the pitch from, from the university, for example, on that side, or from one of the investors there, and then listen to it. Don't just think, well, they're wrong, which is what a lot of people do is they think, no, I'm right, they're wrong, they just didn't understand it. You're wrong because you didn't present it in such a way that they could understand it. And that's a, a key thing about it. So trying to get that feedback and then to evolve your pitch and evolve the way in which you present it so it'll be better uh, next time. Recognizing always that they'll have different motivations and different things they're looking for in each product. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today and sharing some great insights in into the investments and how students can prepare for their upcoming investor round pitches. But just wanted to let the students, the viewers know that we have a, a huge amount of opportunities here at the university. If you are looking for pitching, we have the pitching competition, which will come up 
soon and keep the space watching you. All the links about the more information about the enterprise and entrepreneurship support is available in the description link that you can just click through and watch it and you can directly reach out to us if you need any further support. And that was Mike Hurt. Thank you so much, Mike Hurt, for joining us and staying with us. And ladies and gentlemen, it's Omkar Singh signing off. Thank you.